Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bring our worship, our thanksgiving, and our praise to you this evening. We thank you because you have received the calves of our lips, and you have honored us with your presence in our hearts, visiting us with your Shekinah glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Welcome this evening, hallelujah, amen and amen. All right, welcome, 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 welcome. Okay, I think everybody on Instagram can hear me because you guys are just joining in. I want to spend some time in the Word of God, in the Word of God this evening. All right, everybody can hear me. So that's off. Or I want to spend some time in God's Word this evening um, teaching on something very pertinent. And it's, the topic is uh, the th what David taught his son Solomon. All right. I particularly love David as one of the phenomenal characters in the Word of God. Uh, I uh, really want to sit down and have a chat with him. Even we'll see this evening in talking to his wife, Bathsheba, about the, uh, he was about to take an oath or said he took an oath to her. He said, the Lord who delivered me from all my soul, from all my distress. I take this oath. That's the way he said it. Very interesting um, uh, person and very solid revelation of God. So let's start out with what David, let's just look at it here and look at some things. We'll not be able to finish everything this week. We'll continue next week, all right? And um, I want to start out by saying this, that what probably will David have said, first of all, as one major lesson to Solomon? And one thing we see is that Moses didn't make it, that's take the children of Israel into the promised land. Joshua did it. All right? David didn't fulfill what was in his heart. Solomon did it. And one of the things there is that these second generation leaders, we'll put it this way, had the benefit of being mentored by people who were pioneers. And because those pioneers did not have anybody, so to speak, before them, they made certain mistakes. But then they communicated those things clearly. As Moses taught Joshua, David taught Solomon. And I want to say this. For years I've preached on mentoring, all right? But um, I found this to be very important. People fail, all right, because they are not, people who are talented and gifted and still fail. Now you say, well, uh, failure is not what, okay, failure is the, is for you to live on this earth without fulfilling what you knew in your heart was your potential. The vision, the goals that you had inside your heart as far as your heart could see you did not realize a huge chunk of it to you that is failure. So don't let's measure it by any external things or compare you to somebody else. But we measure it according to what is inside your heart. And many people that experience this is because they are not coached. When we say coached, mentored. When we talk about mentoring now, we are talking not about just gener general things. That is, all right, they are not, you know, that supervision that is required at least at a certain stage within your life to put you right on certain things, we'll see this here as, as we get into it, is just absent. So you may li listen to a person preach, you may, you may, but that hands-on mentoring just isn't there. 
and Moses was able, was, was in a position to mentor Joshua, David could say certain things to Solomon. And that's why these people excelled in what they were doing. All right. So what will David have said to Solomon? Now, let's start out from here. Why did David not get into, uh, fulfill everything that was inside his heart? In 1 Corinthians and chapter, 1 Corinthians, sorry, I said 1 Corinthians, 1 Chronicles and chapter 22, we see where he was being told. Now, David had gone and called Nathan the prophet and told them Nathan the prophet that it was inside his heart that he was going to build a house unto the Lord. And the Lord vowed and entered into an oath with David and blessed David and blessed his lineage because of that. But later on, God came to inform David about why he could not. He could not be the one to build the house of God. And that an, a son must be raised up in his stead who will build that particular house. That the vision was right, but his hands were defiled. And David must have, I'm going to say this, spoken to Solomon about this defilement, what kept him away from building the house of God. And we will see that Solomon actually said certain things that were different from the way in which David approached things when he was king in certain areas. We'll see this. Now, in 1 Chronicles 22 from verse 1 to 13, the Bible says, David said, this is the house of the Lord God and this is the altar of the bond offering for Israel. And he commanded they should gather people. And verse 3, David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors of the gates, which means preparation to build that house. He gathered the raw materials, uh, the joinings, the brass in abundance without weight, also cedar trees in abundance from the Zidonians, and of the tire he brought cedar wood to David. Now, and David said, verse 5, Solomon, my son, is young, my son is young and tender, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent of fame and of glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. Then he called for, his, for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said unto Solomon, hear what he said, my son, as for thee, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, You have shed blood abundantly, and has made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, that is, a man of peace. And I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, because he's a man of rest and a man of peace. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish, he said this, the throne of the kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, he went on. He said, the Lord be with thee, and prosper thou, and build a house of the Lord, as he has said of thee. Only that the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding, give thee charge concerning Israel, 
that you may keep the law of your God. Now, so David was told by God that, listen, he prepared materially for everything, but he was told by God that he could not, those hands could not build the house. He had a blood problem. He said, the earth has drank too much blood from your hands, and therefore you cannot build this house with these bloody hands, so to speak. So find somebody else, your son who shall be a man of rest and a man of peace. And he will build. Now the house of God under the New Testament represents unity, we'll see this, represents peace. So what was the fault that David had that he spoke to Solomon about? There was this impulsiveness about David. We're going to see this in scripture. And there was this vengeful, you know, thing. And that's why when you read Psalms, I'm going to show you this here. And, and you know, you're, you're, my enemies must die. Listen, that's why when Solomon prayed, God told him. He said, you did not ask for the life of your enemies. So, look, some of these things that people do, I'm just telling you that some of these things can be dangerous. And I want to show this in Scripture. There, there are many things, because we don't really read the Old Testament properly. So there are many hidden things there that we don't see. Now, he was told there, all right, that, you know, he couldn't do it because his hands were bloody. Now, somebody had warned David about this, Abigail, Nabal's wife. And we'll see how David was about to react to something. And this was what God was speaking to that, look, you have shed too much blood. Now, what had happened in 1 Samuel? Let's just see this here. Because somebody always comes into your life and tells you something about some hidden fault in you that may become a big trigger tomorrow. Now, 1 Samuel 25 from verse 3. Now, the Bible tells us, all right, there was a man in Moan whose possession were in Camel. The man was very great. He had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats, and was sharing his sheep in Camel. Now, the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding, beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear sheep. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the young men, Get up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be to thee, peace be to thy house, peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now the shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither was there any aught missing unto them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in their eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thy hand unto thy servant and to thy son David. And when the young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all the words in the name of David and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servant and said, Who is David? Now, what David literally did, all right, was, was, was asking for, listen to what I'm saying here. He was asking for protection payment without being directly employed by Nabal for protection. Now, David actually protected Nabal. But he wasn't hired by Nabal to protect him. So it's just like, you're saying, and he said this. Look at what he said here. He, what he called David was an area boy, really. He, he said, Nabal said, David said, who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away everyone from his master. In other words, who is he? So in this must just be some breakaway rascal, all right, that is just on the street because I guess there was an organized way in which things were being done. But David, in all sincerity, all right, protected Nabal's sheep. And these are some of the things that you need to think about in life, in making decisions and understanding that things are deeper than black and white, that there are social contracts, 
that there are unspoken things you have to understand? and become a wise person with social and emotional intelligence? And Nabal didn't have that social and emotional intelligence? Now, David's way of doing it, you could have said, well, maybe Nabal, but, but he didn't have it. Now, now, look at what went on here. And he says, who are these people? Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my sharers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So as far as Nabal was concerned, these were just complete strangers. And you guys are coming to chance me on, on, on my business because I'm a prosperous man. You, you say just we provided protection, this a mafia kind of operation. That, that's what Nabal was saying. But the truth about the matter it was that, yes, it had the appearance of a mafia operation. But the truth about the matter was that David actually helped him. Now, so think about this. But let's get to where David starts showing up now. He now said, so David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him these things. And David, look at what he said, said unto his men, gird every man he sought. That's his response. Was we are going to deal with this man and what he was saying was, I'm going to kill him. This is what God was talking about. Now, he says, gird on every man he sought and gathered on every man his sword. And David also gathered on his sword, and they went up after David 400 men, and 200 abode by the stove. But one of the young men told Abigail, one person doused everything. Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute a master. He railed on them. But the men were very good to us. So they did stuff, but they were not contracted to do it. You have to be careful. All right? And have this high condensation, you know, this thing. I mean, who told you? Who told you? I mean, just like you parking your car somewhere, and then area boys come and they protected your car. They actually protected your car. All right? They said, ah, this belongs to God. And then you come and they say, can you find something for the boys? And this is what, this is what Nabal did. All right, and he says, "What rubbish that did I contract? Did you get out of this place? I even who who employed you? Just come out and all of that. ah, those guys said, eh. Hey. So that's what David wanted to do, and he said it was very good to us, and we were not hurt. Neither missed we hear anything, as long as we were conversant with them. Can you see what's going on here? Conversant with them. We need to read more of the Old Testament. It gives you straight wisdom." When we were in the fields, they were a wall unto us by night and by day. All the while we were with them keeping sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against the master, against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Abigail made haste, took two hundred loaves, two bottles of wine, five sheep ready. Dressed five measures of perch gun, took all that. And she said to her servant, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. And it was so that she rode on the ass, and she came down by the covert of the kill. And behold, David and his men came against her, and she met them. One woman with the army of David. Now David said, Surely in vain have I kept all this, all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missing, all that pertained unto him. And he had requited me evil for good. Now, note that, underline that, evil for good. So, and more also do God unto the enemies of David. If I live, now, see David's reaction to it. Of all that pertain unto him by morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. In other words, all living things that pertain to him will be dead by morning, including the animals. When Abigail saw David, now listen to what this woman told David. It's the same thing God told him. She hasted, lighted off the ass, fell before David on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. That is, put it on, take it, that I am here in the stead of my husband on my knees. Take it that is my husband that is begging you. And let thy handmaid pray thee, speak in thy audience and hear the words of thy handmaid. Say, let me talk. Just listen to my words. 
Listen what she said. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name. Folly is with him. But he was rich. But this man was still rich. All right? Okay. You just think about that. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, hear what she said. And as thy soul liveth, sin the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself of thy own hand. In other words, what God was saying to David was that you have avenged yourself on too many times when people wronged you. When he said, you have shed too much blood, you can't build my house. He was saying, you have avenged. Because this is what she was saying. He says, and from avenging thyself with thy own hand. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thy handmaid had brought unto my Lord, let it even be given to the young men that follow my Lord. Forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. It was the husband, she now stood in as an intercessor. And this is the character that God is talking about. He said, forgive the trespass of thy handmaid. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. She said, David, you are going to have a sure house. Now listen, listen to what she said. Because the Lord fighted the battles of the Lord, and evil has not been found in thee all the days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life. She was prophesying to him with the Lord thy God and the souls of thy enemies shall he sling out as the model sling. And it shall come to pass. Now look at what she said. When the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good he had spoken concerning thee and has appointed thee ruler over Israel, she said, that this shall be no grief unto thee nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood costless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord have dealt well with my Lord, remember thy handmaid. She warned him that when you get there, we'll see this, you will not, what she was saying here, beyond that conviction of your conscience, that to attain to this position that you got to, you did shed blood and avenge yourself. So you can get into certain places by doing wrong things. Not Well, no, no, let me say that you got there by doing wrong things. But there were wrong things that you did, but that didn't stop you from getting to where you were going. However, she was saying when you sit on that throne and you should have peace in your heart and be joyful, the grief... And the blood you have shed will start haunting you there. And your conscience will not be satisfied. Listen to this. When I was going into ministry, I went to see Reverend Emiko in Ibadan. I went into his office. And I said I was going to start. He said, let me tell you this. I won't say everything he said because very sensitive stuff about ministry and about church work. But one of the things he told me, he said, you will succeed. But please don't destroy people on your path towards success. He said, because when you sit down there as a successful person in ministry, your joy will be taken away because your conscience will start to remind you about all the people you backstabbed and did that to get to where you are. Now, this is the scripture he was literally quoting to me. That's why I'm saying that you can't succeed. Nabal was a fool. I mean, the wife said, he said, as his name is, so is he. But he had prosperity. All right? He also was very brash and rash in his decisions and the way in which he spoke. Abigail was calm. All right? He didn't ask anybody. He didn't say, okay, let's get the facts here. Did this man's people actually protect you guys? I you just walked out and said, well, the area boys, and that is that attitude. Now, look what it says here. 
It now goes on. Now we're going to get into this. So the issue was to shed blood. Now let me just read the, the amplified version to you of verse 31. So we get this. Amplified version of verse 31. It says, This shall be no staggering grief to you, or cause for pangs of conscience to my Lord. Either that thou have shed blood without cause. She said, when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all that he had promised concerning you and made you ruler over Israel, this shall be no staggering grief, which means this thing will be grief yours to you. It will take away the joy and cause pangs of conscience. Either that thou hast shed blood without cause, or that the Lord hath avenged himself. And then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to me. And blessed, and blessed be your discretion and advice. And blessed be you who have kept me from blood guiltiness and from avenging my own self with my hand. For the Lord, God of Israel, lives, who has prevented me from hurting you. If you had not hurried to meet me, surely by morning, there will not have been left so much as one meal unto Nabal. This is how David approached and reacted to stuff. And this is what God, you cannot, all right, you, you can't, this is what he did. And this is what God was saying, that there was too much blood. Now, haven't said that. So the issue was that he shed blood. Now I want to show you something here. And he avenged, but he was still king. He, will have, he still became king. Nabal was a fool, but he still was a prosperous man. So don't let us use externalities to judge everything. All right? Because somebody can be somewhere and have a potion and occupy, and he only has 25% of the joy that they should have had because the people that God, the, the, well, let, let, let's, let's, let's just look. So let's look at Romans chapter 12, what the Bible says should be done here. Romans chapter 12. All right, Romans and chapter 12. So we see blood guilt and avenging yourself. Romans 12 and verse 18. Now, it says, if it be possible as much as it lieth in you, it's in your power. I've said this gospel of God, go and kill my enemies, is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have said this thing. This, uh, uh, somebody else, they will must die. It is not biblical. It says, if it be possible as much as it as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. In other words, if Nabal did that thing to David, it was in David's power to decide to forgive and to be peaceable. All right, it wasn't if it's if they came to attack David, I could have said, Okay, I'm fighting back to preserve my life and life of people. But it this was a decision that he took. This is the way he decided to respond to something that somebody did to him. Jesus said, if they take your coat, give them your cloak also. He says, if it be possible as much as it lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for he says, vengeance is mine. In other words, God is the one that will deal with the issue, all right, the way God wants to deal with the issue here. I will repay, said the Lord. Therefore, if, look at what Paul said, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him to drink. This is somebody who despitefully used you. And I'm going to show you that this is what Solomon lent. I will show you. For in doing so, thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. In other words, Satan will come to provoke you 
to do things so that he can steal your joy. He's operating as strategies that he can steal your joy. And even if you get to somewhere, you have the shell, but you do not have that joy. The external is there, but you just are not, you're just not. It's almost like what I read in scripture, the person is living under the wrath of God. Now it says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, how do you overcome evil with good? It's not by Shabala, just Shabala by God. I'm overcoming you evil. It says you are overcoming evil by you being in a position to be favorably disposed towards people that didn't treat you right. You have overcome evil. It says we are passed from death to life because we love. Instead of responding with hate, we did this. It says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. For in doing so, you have heaped up coals of fire upon his head. Which coals of fire is a form of intercession, which means he, you, are, you are moving in with recompense. Now, this is what Paul said. But where did Paul get it from? He got it from Solomon. Where did Paul get this thing from? To show you that Solomon learned this thing from what his father told him. He got this scripture from Solomon. You say, how can you say he got it from Solomon? When he says, if thy enemy be hungry, feed him. Proverbs chapter 25. And verse 21. Solomon here is right. If thine enemy be hungry, Paul quoted Solomon direct. Solomon said, I do not avenge. His father taught him that. He said, you see where I have arrived here today is because I shed blood. I reacted, overreacted. I wasn't a man of peace. You touched me, you knew you touched somebody. I, I, you see throughout his psalms, that's why people say they want to destroy people's life, they don't carry psalms to destroy it. He says, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water. This is Proverbs. That's what Paul was quoting. For thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. He says, I will pay you back. The Lord will reward you. Solomon understood that. God will reward. That's what Abigail was telling David. That leave him alone. God himself will reward you. The man Nabal died of something else. He was, well, had a heart attack, cardiac arrest. It had nothing to do with David. All right? God in heaven will reward you. And many people miss the heavenly reward. I mean, there's a scripture. All right? I'm just there's a scripture some uh, um, oh, we'll look at it but let, let me just say this again look at what look at what Solomon said Proverbs 24 and verse 17 he said to show you the type of man he was rejoice not when thine enemy falleth and let not Thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Solomon said that. Some people want to see their enemy fall. Some people want to see them stumble. Say God has caught them. This is what cost David. He said, lest the Lord see it and it displeased him. And he turned away his wrath from him. Proverbs 16 and verse 7. says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. These are all Solomon's statements. Now you see the enemy, we don't have to go. He says, look, if your ways, if you do what you are supposed to do, even your enemies will be at peace. This is how Solomon, he was a man of peace. David taught him how to get results through peace, full means, not by the sword. In other words, he understood it. That you see all these things I did, I would have gotten there. 
all right? And I would have become, because when I look at it, all right, God took care of business without, and he brought me here. I didn't have to shed all these people's blood. I didn't have to. So he on the, so Solomon understood peace. Solomon was a man, and it wasn't that he was some fool, and that when he did something, he gave them his cloak also. He knew the principle. That when they take your coat, give them the cloak. He knew the principle. Same principle that Abraham put into practice. That he said, let there be no strife between us. Which land do you want? That's your land. Take it. And then he lifted up his eyes. And he saw much more than that. And at the end of the day, the land that, 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 that Lot took, he had to even deliver him from the land. First of all, deliver him. And then the whole thing crumbled. So he understood. You come to, it's not like, you know, you, you, you are, you've become what they say, you are a mumu. No, no, no. You are applying a higher law. You are achieving results using a much higher law than what David said he was operating with. And that's what Solomon came to learn. So when Solomon was therefore going to pray, now, this is first what I get into. That's why Solomon prayed what he prayed. Solomon knew that, look, this is what is the most important thing to ask God for. He understood in his leadership position the most important thing that is most important thing is to look, let, let, let's see the first kings here. Three and verse six. Now, in Gibeon, verse five, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and said, "Ask what I shall give thee." And Solomon said, "My goodness, I've not even started the message. Thou shalt show has shown to thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according to so he was he was conscious of that in truth and in righteous uprightness, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness and given his son to sit on his throne." As it is this day. And now, O Lord, that made thy servant king instead of David my father. I am a little child. I know not how to go out nor come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. He was saying how to handle issues. How to respond. Judgment decisions to make understanding how to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge these people he says the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing and he said because thou hast asked this thing and not asked long life or as riches or as for the life of thy enemies but has asked for thyself to Understanding to discern judgment. Understanding to discern judgment. Which means judgment. You're making decisions, you're decisions, uh, choosing things. says, I want to have judgment. I want to know how to respond. I want to know how to handle issues with people. All right. Now we see this manifested in the life of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 5 when he was going to build the house. He says, Solomon went to Hiram and said, Thou knowest that David my father could not build the house unto the name of his God for wars that were about him on every side until God has put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God had given me rest on every side so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. Hear what he said. No adversary, no evil occurrent. That's deep. And behold, I purpose to build a house unto the name of my Lord, my God, as the Lord spoke to David, my father, and his son. He says, Now, therefore, I command thee, all right, that thou hear me set us out of Lebanon, and my servant shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants, according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us with the skill to hew timbers like you folks here. So he said, I will give money to it. Now, to show this, he tells us, 
In verse 11, and Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household, 20 measures of pure oil. Thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised him, and there was peace. In other words, in his dealings with Hiram, business dealings, there was peace. All right? Peace. He handled the matter properly, and there was peace. And this is one of the major lessons here in terms of dealing and handling issues with people. Right? And seeking out the way of peace, knowing that the Lord himself, I mean, if you are going to be impulsive, if you are going to, you know, be and all of that and, and, and without, con and, you know, and, you know, because, I mean, how do you give power to someone like that? It would be destructive. So, lesson one that David taught Solomon, we find here in Psalm 89 and verse 14. Just, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. The second lesson he taught, we won't get into that this week. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. But the first is the judgment and justice. If you don't pass this, you can know the joyful sound and be singing and singing and singing. It will not be acceptable unto God. Judgment and justice in your dealings. Being fair. Understanding, responding with a much higher, that the Lord was going to reward you. A much higher standard in your justice dealings. I mean, some people can even look at you and say, you're full. And, and let me tell you this. Some of these things, David was pushed in some cases into this blood shedding. That's why I'll get to it. I must get to that place here. Because I'm going to show this. He told Solomon, my friend, you can't surround yourself with people that have shed blood. Or who are prone to doing that. Solomon said, I must get to that point, no matter how long it takes me. Solomon said, by taking out Joab, I have taken blood guiltiness from the lineage of David. He said it with his mouth. You cannot surround yourself or else you're going to reap the consequence of that association. All right? You're going to reap the consequence of that association. Solomon, David had said this, judgment and justice are the habitation of thy throne. Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 3, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. David taught him. To do justice and judgment. David said it in Psalm 89. Solomon repeated it. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable than sacrifice. You shouldn't be found being, you know, People, you, you know, unjust in your dealings. Are, are you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, somebody comes, you say, well, you didn't, let me just give an example here. You didn't send the person. He saw, let me, this, this is what, what talking about. He saw your car was dirty, he washed your car for you. He washed it for you. He just washed the car. You packed somewhere, you didn't send him. This is what number was saying. We didn't send him. He washed the car, everything was washed. And you look at him and say, did I send you? What rubbish is this? But your car was dirty. Listen. And the guy just said to you, which is what David said, find something for me. Now, please, ask yourself this. And you think deeply about it before you make a rash decision. That individual had the capacity to have broken your window too, because you were not there, to look for something he could steal in your car. He chose to wash the car and ask you that anything you have, just give me, because he needed to eat lunch. That's why he did what he did. You have an option of creating an entrepreneur or a criminal. This is what 
Solomon was saying, the kind of judgment God gave him. He looked at her and said, I can create an entrepreneur here, or I can create a criminal. I can create somebody here who can start washing cars for people in the offices. They, have, they come out and everybody finds something until finally he established a car wash. Or I could say, get out. And the guy goes hungry. And the next car he sees, he's not thinking of washing that car. But how do I break into the car and take the bag that is inside the car? In other words, Solomon was talking about a depth in judgment. But you only get to this place when you don't think, all right, that's why Abigail could say prophetic things to David. Things that actually happened to him at the end of the day. That look, David, be careful. The reason is because of the way she, she responded. When she heard, she responded in a certain way. She said, look, this, that money you say you have come to collect from my husband, this is the money. This is the blessing. Look, you are too big for this. Just give it to your boys. So before we get to praise, let's, let's go back, all right? And uh, before we get to it, because the second thing he told him was about, about praise, the joyful sound. But before we get to that, I won't get to that this week. Let, let's just look again at what another conversation he had just before he died with Solomon. Where he said very strong things to Solomon. All right, very, very strong things. Okay? There are very, very strong things that he said to Solomon here. So I just want to know that David ran into trouble because of this, this avenging himself. Be careful of this thing. All right? Careful of this thing. I know Africans, we like to punish our enemies. Be careful. All right? Nobody will tell you how they groan in pain. Nobody will tell you how they hear the voice of the people that they have gone to curse. Nobody will tell you these things. How at night they're disturbed repeatedly. Because you can't shed people's blood and it will not cry. And you should be a person in association with somebody calming them down, not pushing them. All right? If you see that, that's why the, Solomon told David, um, David told Solomon, he said, get rid of the following people. These following people, you have to get rid of them. And you'll see what David said at the end, why those people are to be set aside. Now, first Kings here, and chapter 2. Now, the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying. So here's the final meeting between David and Solomon. Some of the most powerful Wisdom principles here. If I saw something today, I saw something today when I read it. I said, what is this? That spiritual things are deep. He said, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong therefore and show thyself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God. Walk in his ways. Keep the statutes, commandments, judgments, written law of Moses. All right, that you may prosper in all you do, whithersoever you turn yourself, that the Lord may continue his word, he spake concerning thee, and talked about children. All right? Sorry. Sorry, before we get there, to what's this cause. Let, let's start from chapter 1. Now, King David was old, stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes. But he had no heat. Therefore his servant said to him, Let there sought for a Lord a king, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him. Let her lie in his bosom, that the Lord, may take some, the Lord my king may take some heat. So they sought for some fair damsel throughout the coast of Israel, found Abishag, the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. Don't forget that name, because the name, she played a role somewhere. And the damsel was very fair, cherished the king, and, and, and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. Now, and Adonijah, the son of Haggith, because the father was old, the man was dying, heard about it, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. Now, I want you to see something here. I want you to say something here. What, how come Adonijah did this? I prepared him chariots, horsemen, 50 men to run before him. 
And his father had not displeased him at any time, saying, Why hast thou done so? And he was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. And so Absalom and him problem people. And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they following Adonijah helped him. But Zadok, the priest, Benaiah, the son of Jehoda, and Nathan, the prophet, and Shema and Rea, the mighty men which belonged to David, were not with Adonijah. Adonijah slew sheep, oxen, fat cattle by the stone of Zoheleh, all right, called the brethren, and he began to have a party. So he said, I'm king, and started throwing the party of a king. Now, watch this. But Nathan the prophet and Benai and the mighty men of Solomon, his brother, he called not. So he didn't invite some people. Things always play out. So this guy came with division. All right. Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Has thou not heard that Anonja, the son of Hadid, doth reign? And David, our Lord, knows it not. All right. And Joab also. Joab that was hanging around David didn't say, let's go and tell David. He, he followed, all right, the problem. Now, therefore, come, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel that thou mayest save thy own life and the life of thy son Solomon. In other words, if this man becomes king, he's killing you and killing your son Solomon. Go and get thee in unto King David and say unto him, Did thou, my lord, O king, not swear unto thy handmaid, which David had done, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, thy son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. Why then doth Adonijah reign? Behold, while you are yet talking to the king, I will come after and confirm. In other words, you go in and start saying it. Then I will come and confirm the word, so that the king will be convinced. And Bathsheba went into the king and began to, or I say that. And Bathsheba bowed and did opposite to the king. And the king said, Woe well, down. She said, My lord, you swear. Now look how it says, You swear unto the Lord, unto thy handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me. And now Adonijah reigneth, and now my lord, thou knowest it not. And he has slain oxen, fat cattle, sheep in abundance, called the sons of the king, Abitha, the priest, Joab, and all of that. And thou, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are upon thee, that thou shalt tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord, the king, after him. That's why leadership should not be quiet at, at strategic moment, because they were waiting. Otherwise, it shall come to pass that when my lord, king, shall sleep with their fathers, I and Solomon, my son, shall be counted as offenders. We are gone. And lo, while she yet talked, Nathan the prophet came in and told the same thing. And Nathan said, My Lord King, verse 24, Adonijah just reign after me and he sit upon the throne. For he has gone down this day and slain and done all of that. But me, even my servant Zadok the priest, and he says, Is this thing done by my Lord King, that thou hast not showed it to thy servant, who shall sit on the throne of my Lord the King after him? And King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore and said, As the Lord liveth that had redeemed my soul out of distress, even as I swore unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, thy son shall reign after me. He shall sit upon the throne in my stead. So will I certainly do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed and went. And the king David called Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and called all of them, and said, Take servants, and cause Solomon to rise upon my mill, bringing them to Gihon. Let Zadok and Nathan prophet anoint him there by Israel, blow the trumpet, and say, God save the king. And ye shall come up after him, and may come and sit upon my throne, for he shall be king in my stead, for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel. All right? And they did as that. All right? So Zadok and all of them went to effect it. Okay? So, what happened was in verse 40, and all the people came after. I'm still going to go back and teach something. I just want to read the story. And the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy, so the earth rent a sound. So people started singing, Solomon is king. Now, Adonijah was having his party with his guests. And Adonijah and all the guests that were with him had eat as they made an end of eating. So they were getting to the end of the food in the party. Now, you picture this. Now, look at guys that went to party. Look how they responded. And when Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, Wherefore is this noise is it being an opera? Is it in an opera? And while he yet spoke, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abitha, the priest came, and Adonijah said to him, Come in, for thou art valiant man, bring it good tidings. Jonathan answered and said to Adonijah, Verily, our Lord King David has made Solomon king, sir. And the king has said, Zadok the priest, and all of this. 
as Zadok the priest and Nathan prophets had anointed him king in Gihon, and, and they come up from thence rejoicing so that the city rang and the noise that you have heard. This is the noise you have heard. And as Solomon seated, and also Solomon seated on the throne of the kingdom. Moreover, the king's servant came to bless the Lord King David, saying, God, make the name Solomon better than thy name. And also thus said the king, Blessed be Lord God of Israel that has given me one to sit on the throne. Now, verse 49. And all the guests that were with Adonijah were afraid and rose up, and every man went his way. Kingdom is not democracy. Everybody, once they heard there was movement, everybody packed quietly started leaving because they were talking about power has moved. Everybody disappeared. Now, let me start because of time and show you where this error came. And this error came from David. And David was passing this information across to Solomon on how to deal with people. Listen, how did Adonijah have the gods? And to show you that this chap had a a what you call self-sabotage problem. After his father died and Solomon spared him, he went to meet Bathsheba and said, that young lady, Abishag, the Shunammite, that he wants to marry her, he should give him one of his father's concubine so that he can. And Solomon looked at him and said, this day your life is gone. You mean we forgave you? You tried to become king? Now you are now... So there was something in him. You are now taken so that there are no other ladies in the whole. Is your father's ex? Right? You want to go and take so that you now have this posture of being king. But this is where Adonijah's problem came from. Listen, the Bible tells us that it tells us. The Bible says that. In verse 5, then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king, and he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Now, this is the problem. Next verse. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, why hast thou done so? He also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him. In other words, David never corrected Adonijah when he was growing up because he didn't want Adonijah to be displeased. David, as strong as he was, he, when he came to the same thing that happened to, to Eli, says you have not corrected the own children inside your own house. Now, this is a very strong leadership lesson. Because you don't want to lose favor with people. You don't want them to go. And these people like these who are set in close proximity to people who are in leadership and authority, you don't correct them because they're going to go into some mood swing, all right, and be humming around for, for, for three days. Now you tell them point blank, point blank. That's why the Bible says that the chastisement of God is grievous. It is not a joyous experience, but if you are without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. A bastard there meant, it's not that you are not a child of the father, but you are illegitimate. You were on the streets, right? the bastards, they took them to the streets and stoned them because they were without correction. So what had happened was that David raised his sons there without any correction. Because he didn't want to displease so some of the problems that Solomon had, and I'm telling you that this also was transferred to people like Joab and all of that, and some of the problems that he had came as a result of this, and he was going to tell Solomon that, look, Solomon, listen to this. I didn't do this. You've got to finish this business. All right? This business has got to be finished. Or else you might end up exactly where I was or where I am at this particular moment. So he didn't correct. Now, correcting doesn't mean you destroy people, but you destroy people's more. I mean, I mean, I mean, but you have to, you can't say as a leader or someone in authority 
all right, or as a parent, that you are not going because you don't want to, which means it's almost like you are now in a popularity contest, con contest there when you are supposed to be. All right, putting people right. And why do you have people in society today that misbehave that work? It's because people in authority that were to correct them didn't want to displease them. And, and people grew up on that without correction. And then you now come out and say something in public, which is what happened to Adonijah, went to request for his father, so and he didn't know. He did not know that that request was, he was asking for his life. He didn't know that you don't talk like that because nobody stood their ground and against him and said, no, you are going to be circumcised on this. David was he out of that omission there was the one that caused that ninja to write. And I've seen this in many people. If you see something small, call the person and tell the person, look, this ain't right. All right? I mean, growing up as a Christian, I remember when I started preaching in campus fellowship. I'll go up there, go and preach. And um, one day I preached, they allowed them. When I got there, I didn't like what they said to me. The president of the fellowship said, don't ever go on the pulpit and say that kind of thing you said there again. Don't say that. In fact, one time we were sharing in the room, he said, you are sharing in this room, you are talking like, don't talk like this on the pulpit. Now, I don't forget some of those things. It, it, they, didn't, they, 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 they didn't sound, it, I was hot. But my friend, Solomon himself said, talked about the flattery of, and I say, unfaithful at the wounds of the friend. He understood that. And let me tell you this, what you don't, okay, let, 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 me, let, let me not go that far. So what happened was in the next chapter, let me close. Now the days, as First Kings 2, now the days David drew near, he would die, he charged Solomon and son, so that I go the way of the whole earth. Be thou strong therefore and show thyself a man. So David said, tell him, be strong. You've got to be strong. I was weak in some issues. Absalom literally drove his father out of the stuff. This was going on because of lack of correction inside the house. Literally drove him out of the, drove him out of the place. And keep the charge of the Lord, walk in his ways and his statutes. And the Lord may continue and told him. Now, he told him. He now told him. Do therefore according to thy wisdom, he said this. Moreover, thou knowest, verse 5, also what Joab the son of Zerah did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, unto Abner the son of Nah, Amasa, whom he slew, and shed the blood of war in peace. So some of this blood shedding, some of it was even people around David that maybe out of weakness, or he allowed them to, he, you, I mean, and all that came on David. Look, how, how do we know this? Let me just show you this, and I'll close here. I'll continue next to it. It says, All right. Now, so Joab, verse 28, Then tidings came to Joab, and Joab turned after Adonijah, Though he turned not after Solomon, Joab fled into the tabernacle of the Lord, caught hold of the horns of the altar when he knew he was in trouble with Solomon. And he was told King Solomon that Joab has fled into the tabernacle. Behold, he is by the altar. And Solomon sent Benad, son of Joab, saying, Go and fall on him. And he got to the tabernacle and said all of that. And then the king, in verse 31, said unto him, Do as he had said, and fall upon him and bury him. Hear what he said that thou mayest take away the innocent blood which Joab shed from me and from, my, from the house of my father. And the Lord shall return his blood upon his own head, who fell upon two men who were more righteous and better than he, and slew them with the sword that my father David knew nothing about, Abner of Na and the captain of Israel, and Amasa and this, the, their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab from our own head, from our own family. That's what Solomon was saying. Return upon the head of Joab 
and upon the head of his seed forever. But upon David and upon his seed and upon his house and upon his throne, there shall be peace forever and ever. He shifted. This is what I'm saying. Joab was a problematic person in the kingdom of David. And some of the things that God was holding David for were done by Joab. And, and Solomon, therefore, was told. Now, I don't want to because I know people will start. Will st will, if you want to teach this, you teach the whole thing. Or else people will take one something and run away and start saying this is their problem. So, so I, I will stop here. But I'm telling you that that's why David told Solomon, he said, look, some of these things that hung on my head. And that's why you have to be very, I mean, I'm, I'm going to talk about it on Sunday, I'm teaching on, on productivity by labor, association. Listen, association. You cannot be, ca look, look, the curse that was placed on Cain, you know, on Adam, the ground, was that the sweat of your face. Why? Because of association around you. And he started even from his family, Cain, killing Abel. All right? Association. Who surrounds you? Okay? I mean, somebody went into the boat of some folks going somewhere, and the wind started. A association. And David told him, he said, look, 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 look. Look. The blood of these people will cry. It will land on his own house. It's going to be on our own house. It will be on our family. And to be on our descendants. All right? So, and, and a lot of what he was doing, he was doing it behind the back of David. All right? And probably David didn't have that, that um, uh, you know, sometimes you can, go and, you can go and deal with a number, but you cannot deal with somebody that is close with, to you and show judgment there. But outside, you can be shouting. But inside, you don't do it. All right, we'll stop there for, for today here. Okay, spent one or ten minutes on this. Uh, I, hope, I hope you are blessed by this. One or ten minutes, we will continue next week on things that, that um, 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 David said to Solomon and taught him, all right, and, and this increases your, your, your in wisdom, social intelligence, ability to relate with people, okay, understanding things. Not everything is black and white. There are hidden social contracts in life. Um, you, you, you have to be conscious of things, all right, uh, and very conscious. That's why Paul, when he was preaching, he said, I did not shun from giving you the counsel of God. He said, I gave you the He said, so I'm not guilty of any man's blood. And I said, I'm not guilty of anybody's blood. All right, so it's important, okay, that, that, that um, um, we handle things the way God wants us. All right, to handle things, okay? And many people on the streets today that have gone, because people that were responsible for their lives did not speak up, or when they started talking, it was too late. You speak, right? Didn't, didn't do things, it was too late, okay? All right. God bless you all.